Thank you very much um, for the introduction. So actually, I'm, a, um, I'm not a password guy. So actually, so technically, I'm rather a cryptographer. But I'm going to give a talk which is not too technical, so don't be afraid. I'm, I'm going to keep it, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully um, the high level enough and not too boring. OK, so I'm, I'm going to talk about a paper that, uh, that uh, me, Tillman Frosch, Martin Gohl, and Thorsten Holtz uh, worked on. And well, it's called location privacy in the absence of anonymous payment. But it's essentially, I would, I would rather say that it's, it, it's a story of, of a struggle, of a struggle um, between, so of, of a struggle of, of finding an authentication mechanism between, between different parties and conflicting, um, and conflicting motives. On the one hand, vendors, users, and uh, also law and, and regulation authorities. OK, let's start. So, so in general, we will be considering a, a setting with basically four entities, customers, vendors, terminals like these, where you can kind of pay for, for um, for your ride, for your bike um, to, to ride through the city, for example, and a clearinghouse that, that manages uh, all these billing processes and um, well, charges the customer and, and transfers the money to the vendor. OK, so uh, actually, the problem is, is, is that general, but for concreteness and for the joy uh, to, uh, to share with you the joy of, of our work, um, I'm, I'm going to concentrate on a very specific case, the case of electric vehicle networks, okay, which is a big thing. So um, <clears throat> basically, we, we, we have the same four parties, customers, then we have these charging stations, then there's a vendor, the vendor in, in, in this setting is the electric utilities company, and we have the clearinghouse. And well, the, the system intuitively works as follows. That a customer has an electric vehicle, and he or she, they, they try to charge their vehicle at some charging station. The charging station is connected to the power grid, which is in turn connected to the electric utilities company, which produce electrical energy. And, the, and, and there's also a, a, a data flow from the terminals, the charging stations, to the clearinghouse. The clearinghouse job is to, to register um, <clears throat> who charges which amount of, of, of energy um, in, in the network of, of which utilities company. Right? So its, it's job is to, to, um, to administer the billing processes over here and to distribute the money received according to the power consumption in the um, for the electric utilities companies. OK. So this is a vision of our future mobility systems, of uh, our future um, traffic systems, right? And well, actually, it doesn't seem like, but this is a, a really huge game changer in, in several respects. So the first. The first real game changer is, is that at this point, we do not have oil companies anymore, OK? This time, we are talking to, elect, to electric utilities company, big companies, which have a, a traditional their business field, traditional expertise in their field, traditional ways of, of communicating with customers and with uh, clearinghouses. So this is one thing. The second thing is, is, is rather, rather techno, they're technologically motivated, and this, is, um, this concerns those vehicles. The capacity of, of modern batteries isn't, isn't too great, so for one. Um, and people, there's, there, there's also this, this thing of, um, of, of the, I guess it's called distance anxiety, where people are afraid of not, be able, of, of not being able to come home. Uh, because uh, the, the battery is too low. So the general 
your recommendation and the general vision is to have your car, anywhere you park it, be plugged in. So first of all, this is good for you because there's, there's, always, there's always enough energy in your car to come home. And secondly, it also benefits um, the entire system because it provides some buffer for energy. Right? So people and, and electric um, and the, the producers of electric energy, they might use the buffer in your car, the capacity of your battery, to store some electricity in there. And this, again, what, so well, giving people access, those company access to your, to your battery, might benefit you financially. Okay? This is also quite reasonable. Okay. So let's see. So, and, well, the European Commission is, has plans uh, for, these, for, the, um, for, the, for, for increasing the structure of, of these networks. And plans say that uh, until the year 2020, there should be 800,000 charging stations across Europe. Okay, so this is, there, there's some really huge force behind that. <coughs> It's, it's going to change how we charge our, our vehicles. So another point I would like to, to stress is that, well, because you are kind of, you are kind of supposed to, to um, charge your vehicle every time the, the car stops and you go out shopping or into, into your house or something, you need a very dense infrastructure. Basically, every parking place, right? The vision is that, that, that every parking spot where you can park a vehicle or a garage is, is, is equipped with, with um, these things over here, right? So everywhere you should be able to, to, um, to charge your, your car. Okay. So... <clears throat> Well, there's, as I said, those, those guys over here, they are really big players, and they have traditional business models, and they have, all, and, and, and they have also traditional restrictions. And those restrictions, usually laws, they are different, um, they differ by country, of course, but in general, they are, they are some, some very strict, there are usually some very strict um, laws or regulations that require people to um, impose some, 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 technical, some technical means in these communication flows, right? For example, I can give you a very concrete example. One concrete example is that if a customer pays for the charging of his vehicle, he might have a complaint, right? He might be like, no way, this is much too expensive. The meter inside the charging station is surely broken. And because of these reasons, law tries to, to make the process more transparent and support the, the user, law prescribes that in every billing process for charging, there should be information on the meter, on the meter within this uh, charging station. Okay? Always. And this is a unique identifier. Okay, so seeing this picture over here, there's a huge elephant in the room, and the elephant is, is called payment, right? So how do we pay for this? How do customers pay for this? And if you think about it, so I guess the most, the most natural solutions are, first of all, to consider cash. Okay, and this seems to be a nice solution, it provides anonymity in, in a classical sense, but it has a huge problem. And the huge problem is that in contrast to, to, to the infrastructure of, of, of gas stations, which are kind of polycentric, where you have one or like two, perhaps like a dozen of, of, gas, of gas station in a suburb, which is a small number, where you can collect money and transfer the money back and forth, to some other locations. If you have those, those terminals everywhere around the street, then it's really hard and it's really expensive to collect all the money. Really, really expensive. So this doesn't work, right? And it's, it's also a waste of time. It's also a waste of, 
of resources, in a sense, if you can do it electronically. The second thing is, which, which comes to mind is the, electric, uh, el the electronic um, counterpart to that, anonymous electronic cash. And this is actually really good. So this is, in an ideal world, we would have that, right? And I would be the first to, to, to raise my hand and, and support this idea, right? But there are some, there are some, some other opinions, right? Especially those vendors, right? So they have some counter arguments against that. And those arguments are, <laughs> first of all, there is less experience and they are not widely adopted, those electronic cash systems, even though they are, theoretically, they have been devised in the, in the 80s. <clears throat> the second thing is that there, is, there, is, uh, there are very effective and uh, yeah, good working um, um, well, mechanisms to resolve those dispute situations. For the electric for the for the utilities, and for those mechanisms, you should you need to find an equivalent, right? It doesn't seem too too easy. And finally, the utility um, companies, the electric utility companies, they are really keen on on, on protecting their investment, their finance, their financial investments. So right, so they do not want to move. They want their investment. Ideally, they do not want to change anything in their structure. Because, well, the structure is the same structure that they use for conventional electricity payment. Okay. So that's quite, quite a sad story. So and well, as you, as probably quite unsurprisingly, well, there's also a, a, a third solution. And with this solution is exactly what what electrical utility companies already do, right? They, they can give you prepaid offers or postpaid billing offers where you kind of consume electricity and later on they, they measure all those, those charging events and later on they, they will just charge you money, okay? So that's the existing payment model for, for the utilities and they, of course, they, they want to have it, but it also has some, some other benefits some other benefits. It allows for diverse offers of electric energy. For example, when you want to have a, a threshold, right? So below that threshold, it's cheap. And after that, it's expensive. So these are very tricky business models. And some people really like that. Or um, in, in some situations, there might be legal obligations to have users non-anonymous. Non so, and in these cases, you can't use those two, right? For some reason, there might be these legal obligations. Okay. So. So what we try to, well, isolate here is, is a dilemma. A dilemma between the transparency that is prescribed by law. And actually, this is a good idea. It, Transparency is, is, means that in case of a dispute, the user has some handle, some reference, saying that over here I've been a victim of some fraud. The, the, um, the company, the utility company, they, it, it charged too much money. Right? This is, um, there's no ill will behind it. Okay? And on the other hand, we have something which is which is also very important and, and well, but before we continue, uh, I would like to, 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 to set you in the, right, in the right mood of mind, okay? Perhaps we, we all, like, with an overwhelming vote, we would all vote for electronic cash here, right? So, but, so just, just consider the situation is, is unchangeable here, right? Take that as a starting point, right? Think, try to, Try to start thinking from this point in time. Consider we are in a situation where we can't change it, okay? Where those big, big utility vendors, they won't accept e-cash, okay? And they, they want to do their traditional billing process. And for the billing process, they need to identify users, okay? This is a given. For us now, this is a given, okay? That's the situation. 
But for us, right, so as, as researchers, as, as people who are interested to make, to, to find good solutions, to find a compromise even, right? So there's perhaps even something we can do because there's another problem, okay? And the problem we are talking about here is called location privacy, okay? And, there's, and there are some, some law guys that define location privacy in the following sense. It's the ability of an individual to move in a public space, the expectation that under normal circumstances, their location will not be systematically and secretly recorded for later use. This is what we would like to implement, right? But we already know, so they are, in every billing process, there will be an identifier to the user because they do traditional billing. Okay, so now, in a sense, the, the, the problem is that law prescribes that um, in every billing process, there needs to be the reference to the internal meter of the charging station, which is unique, and a unique reference to some locations. Those charging stations are supposed to not move around. Okay? So, what makes things worse is that in dense networks, in what we like to have, right, later on, the situation gets even worse because in dense networks you have a lot of charging stations and you can even have more, even more accurate profiles. Sorry. <laughs> okay. And also, just keep in mind this, this dispute thing, right? <coughs> where, where users want to have a handle on, on the charging station, being able to point at a concrete charging station in case there is a dispute. Or the, 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 the customer feels that there has been some fraud or some broken meter. Okay, so that's the situation. <coughs> so the electric unities, utilities, they won't move. Traditional billing. So they, they, it's, it's kind of in their interest to, to be honest, right? But they, they might be curious and be interested in, in location, of, in, in location pro, um, profiles. Um, so, but if we try to design something which, which works here and improves location privacy, it should integrate quite well with the, with the traditional solutions, with the traditional network, right? So it's a very pragmatic approach. And also, it, it should allow for the traditional way of, of resolving disputes, the legal way, right? Which works quite well, actually. So, also, there are, there are now kind of those contradicting legal requirements. Uh, Location-specific information must be retained, right, for, for later claims of, uh, of, of fraud or for the disputes. And, and also, there, there must be something where the, where the um, charging station authenticates data, right, in a non-repudiable way, like saying that, so that later on, the, the, char the, the provider of the charging station kind of come up and say like, okay, yeah, sure, you got the data from my charging station, but we didn't, we actually did not create it. Someone else created it. So they should be held accountable. Okay, these are the requirements. Okay, this is, this is the situation we start from. And the challenge is, is, is kind of uh, real. We want to prevent creation of movement profiles. It's not much that we can do. We would like to have e-cache, but uh, it's a start. So it should integrate well, be compliant, and be compliant with dispute mechanisms. So what is our approach? So our approach is actually quite simple, and it, it, and it uses it, it relies on a, on a smart choice of fitting cryptography, right? I'm going to explain that, but not too, too in depth. And and it's it, it the the, uh, the handle is over here. The handle is the authentication of the of the metering data by the charging station. Okay, we try to do it better at this point. Okay. So what, what do we do? We, we need to authenticate customers. This is a given. We also need to authenticate billing-relevant data. 
it should be non-repudiable. Now, non-repudiation always points to digital signatures. So the um, electronic analog of, of real world signatures, so to speak. But in this case, we will use something which is called group signatures, <coughs> right? And I've, I've done a lot of research on group signatures and well, they, they can be used as a general as a general substitution for, for digital signatures, but in this scenario, they fit particularly well, really well. So it's, I guess it's the most convincing scenario where, where we can use group signatures. And now I'm going to explain group signatures. So group, group signatures also have a long history. They, they were introduced in 1991. And the idea is that signatures cannot be only be produced on behalf of a single user, but on behalf of a group. Okay, a well-defined group, a group where I can join and uh, leave the group structure. Okay, so now the very um, verifier should be able to check that the data is authenticated, right? So that it hasn't been modified on the way. And it should also be able to check that the signature was issued by a group member. But it shouldn't be able to identify which group member exactly. That's the catch. That's the clue, right? And this should hold in a very strong sense, okay? And this is not comparable to, 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 to pseudonyms. Well, if you use a pseudonym, right, and you use it again and use it again, you can also make some profiles. And there's, there's only this one last step where you map an identity to the pseudonym. In this sense, we are talking about something which is, which is stronger. It means that once you have a signature and another signature, you cannot tell if, if those are, are created by the same signer. Okay? So there's basically no pseudonym. The, the, you could, as a, in, in a sense, you could assume that for every signature, there's a new pseudonym, right? But this is only, this is, this is very hand wavy. Right, so there, there is no pseudonyms and there's, there's a strong form of anonymity called unlinkability. You cannot link two signatures of the same user. You cannot find which of, of the signatures belong to the same user, okay? Okay, now I'm going to give you some information on the mechanics behind that. I'm not going into details, but I'm, I'm trying to give you a step-by-step a -step understanding of, of of how it works, and I'm going to start with, com with a comparison with usual digital signatures. Okay, we start off there. So, um, just a warning, the, the picture will be really overloaded and, and really ugly, but as we step through, okay, it, it should be understandable, I guess. So, in digital signatures, we have a certification authority, our root of trust. We have a user and a verifier. And there are several algorithms involved that different parties <coughs> invoke, okay? So the first one is a, is a key generation algorithm. The key generation algorithm for the certification authority generates the secret key and the public key, okay? The next algorithm is an algorithm where a user constructs a public key and a secret key, okay? And now the user can use its public key and its knowledge of the users of, of its secret key, not sending its secret key over, but it can use its knowledge and, and do some computations and obtain a certificate. This certificate says that basically the public key of user UI is okay, right? I've checked the public key, so this is the intuition. I've checked the public key and it's okay. It really belongs to user UI. Now, the next step is that we can do with the digital signature is we can take the secret key and some message M, okay? And we can sign it and create a signature S, okay? And this signature is, is, is a, very, a very close analogy of, of real world signatures, right? It says that we, it is usually interpreted in this way, we, the signer, confirm that we believe that we, um, that we hold true to the statements in this message, okay? And then people that might receive a message and some signatures, they need a way to check if this signature is okay. And for that, they use the signature, they use the message and the certificate, 
and also the public key of the CA, and they first check if the certificate is okay, and then they check if the signature is okay. And then if all is positive, they accept, and otherwise they reject. Okay, this is traditional digital signatures. Now I'm going to, as a, in, in, in contrast to that, I'm, I'm going to, to describe to you group signatures, how they work, okay? The setup is similar, but it gets more complicated, admittedly. So there's a, there's a group manager. It's, this guy is not called certification authority anymore. It's a group manager. So there are group users, and there's a verifier. OK. The group manager creates several keys. This key over here is a secret key to issue something. It's the issuer key, right? It issues. And over here, there's a, a separate key. And those keys, they, they do not need to be related. And this key over here is the opener key. OK? So, and, and for each of those keys, there is also, once again, a corresponding public key. And this public key, those two public keys, they are made public and accessible to everyone. OK? And, in, in our mind, and actually you can also implement it in that way, we can think of the group manager to be divided into two entities, an issuer and an opener. Someone that issues certificates and someone that does opening. Okay? So again, the user just produces a public key and a user secret key. And then again, there is some process before that it was uh, called the issue cert, but it's it's, it's, very, um, it's, it's very much the same <coughs> process where the user inputs its public key, uses knowledge of its secret key, and obtains some, some form of certificate. Right? It's, it looks more complicated than a traditional one, but it's a certificate. Now, and again, it can now use the secret key and also this certificate over here. Now we also need the certificate to sign a message and get a signature. Okay, and now again, the signature is a signature saying that now there's, there, there's a huge difference in the interpretation. This signature, and I'm, I'm going to wait until we see the verification process. So now to verify this signature, to verify this signature, we do not need the public key of the user. Okay, that would be bad for our uh, unlinkability guarantees because then it would point to some guy, right? To verify this thing, the signature. We just need the group public key, okay? And, in, and the interpretation of this is that this message, if the verify process outputs accept, this means that this message has been signed by one of the group members, not more, okay? Okay, and now here's the tricky part. So, I just told you that this only reveals that it has been signed by one of the group guys over here, right? But in our setting, where we also consider disputes, it would be useful, in case of dispute, to revoke that anonymity, right? To find the identity in some specific scenario where some, some trustworthy parties are involved, okay? And they can point to, to, the, to the signature and, and have some, some, some good cause, right? Some, some, some good legal case saying that, please open it, there has been some problems. Because I, the user, wanted to be open to, to show to you um, the meter that was involved in the fraud, okay? Okay, so there's, an, there's another process and this process only works if one has the, the, the secret opening key, okay? Some entity with the opening key and only this identity is able to, um, to find identities in signatures, right? And this should be an exemption, and, right? It's, it shouldn't be the, the rule, right? That's the whole idea. The, the idea is that if everything works well, then you, then you are guaranteed anonymity. But in case there's something wrong, and, and now in, in this context, it's in the interest of the user to have that, right? To, 
to make part of this profile um, um, public. Okay, the charging station, it won't care, right? So, but it's, it's a decision of the user to make that profile and, and prove that in this very specific charging um, event, there has been some fraud, and uh, in that signature, in, the, in those information sent over to the uh, clearinghouse, there was this particular meter, okay? Now, and there's also another algorithm which is not too important, but it basically proves if, it, it basically checks if the proof of the opener pointing to some identity is actually <coughs> okay. Okay, so, right? Okay, so what you see, intuition on a slightly more cryptographic, and this is the most cryptographic you can get, I guess, is, um, is to, to imagine that you can think of a group signature containing of a ciphertext. And this ciphertext always encrypts the, the certificate of the user, right? And this certificate is, is uniquely bound to the user, but it is encrypted, and it is encrypted to the opener. And now we know the opener has a secret key and it can get the certificate. Okay, but we have to make sure one thing, right, that in this ciphertext there actually is a valid certificate, right, and not some nonsense. Otherwise we couldn't trace, trace the charging station that generated this particular metering information. Okay, so there needs to be some proof. The first proof is that Actually, there, there is some valid certificate in that ciphertext. And the second one relates to the user, but it's also a proof which doesn't give any information, but it says that the guy that issues the, um, the charging station that issued the signature knows a secret key which fits, which fits um, the specific certificate. Okay? And this is basically a group signature. Right? Those proofs over here, they guarantee that no other information is revealed except for the information that those statements are true. Right? And, and this information is very crucial for the opener. But this is, this is how usually group signatures are made to work. Okay, so there's a very formal sense in, in which you can define what group signatures should provide. In, in form of security games, but very informally, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you an intuition. First of all, this, this anonymity property, and even better, unlinkability, right? You, you cannot decide if two signatures belong to the same person or not. This is really strong. Then there is traceability, and this is why we do the second zero knowledge proof. We need to make sure that once a signature is accepted, that you can always find the charging station behind the signature, the issuer. Okay, and then there is something which is called collision resistance. So we want to we want to avoid situation in which an attacker just attacks a single charging station, and the and the insecurity spreads over to the entire network. So even if if the attacker knows some secret information, and even if there's several information and colludes with all those secret information, then we should still be sure as long as for the 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 other. As long as there's no attack for the other charging station, that's fine, okay? And then we can, in a, in a process, try to identify the bad ones and uh, repair them. So, and we, and we implemented that at this specific point where we, that I sketched you over, we, we carefully chose a fitting group signature scheme. The scheme that we, we used is by um, those two guys over here, Poncheval is quite famous for, for his work on group signatures. And it's, it's, it's a very strong one, also in the sense that it <coughs> provides some provable security guarantees, also in the sense that I didn't sketch, in the very formal scheme. So what is also very nice about it, it, it has comparably fast sign-in, and it supports something which is called batch verification. So verification in that scheme is prohibitively slow. Signing is, 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 is fast, but verifying is slow. But there's some technique where you can get, where you can, as a, as a receiver, wait for all those signatures to come in, do some, yeah, do some computations, some, 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 some very cheap computations, and then just uh, verify once. Okay, so it, it scales in, an, in a good sense. Then. So it has small signatures, and as I said, very strong security properties. 
so we also implemented it. So there's a, there's a, there's a GitHub um, archive for that. So let me see. So we, we tried two architectures uh, for, for this, the charging stations. We, we chose, first one is uh, an Intel Atom with one gigabyte RAM. And the second one is a free scaled IMX 53, uh, also one gigabyte RAM. So, and, and you can see the information on that, right? So here for CS2, you have like 41, 41, um, their signings. No, let me see. One signing per 41 milliseconds, okay? It's not, it's not super good, but for, but for just a, a single charging station, there, there is not too much traffic, right? So it's going to have a bill and then send the data. That's okay. And now for verification, which is kind of the bottleneck over here, <coughs> batch verification, they get some, um, there are a lot of improvements where you can have, like, let me see. We have an Xeon X5650, two gigabyte RAM. And we can basically come at, at, at 93 messages per second, okay? You need some infrastructure for that, even though we use batch, batch verification. So there is still one problem missing. Now we have group signed metering data. We, well, we are, in, in the first step, the, the um, charging station is, is, not, um, is not identifiable. But there's also, there's also traces that point to some location on the network level. So you also have to make sure that you use some, some, um, some techniques to hide, um, to hide all information um, on the network level about locations. Okay, and the best we can have so far is, is, is a Tor network. So we, we need to use a Tor network at this point. Okay. So to summarize, so it, this solution is a compromise, right? Because actually we want to have things that are much better, but obviously the reality needs compromise. And well, it's the, the, the important thing is that it should integrate quite good with existing business and legal processes. And well, we try to implement, there, there's, there's a GitHub, and it's also the first complete implementation of this group signature scheme, which is really tricky to implement. So that's a reference. Thank you very much for your attention.